Welcome back to another episode of the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Neil C. Hughes, and as always, I'm ready to take you on yet another journey through the constantly evolving landscape of technology. And today, I've got a very special guest lined up for you. Her name is Zenobia Godschalk, and she's a well-respected figure in the blockchain space and the Senior Vice President of Communications for Hedera Hashgraph. And she's going to join me today to unravel the intricate web of the internet, the blockchain, and our privacy. So much to get through here, and she is an insightful speaker, a tech industry mentor, and a strong advocate for women in tech. But I want to dive deep today in the realm of Web3, blockchain, security, real-world adoption of blockchain and distributed ledger technology, and how we've transitioned from being internet users to internet products. So buckle up and hold on tight, because no matter where you're listening in the world, I'm going to be beaming your ears all the way to Atlanta, Georgia, where Zenobia is waiting to share her story. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is Zenobia Godstock, and I run communications across the Hedera ecosystem. I sit within Swirls Labs, where I am the SVP of communications. And we support, if you think about the different parts of the Hedera ecosystem, there is the Hedera network and the governing council that governs the network, Swirls Labs, which provides development and marketing support for Hedera. And then there are a number of foundations and other ecosystem partners that help with grant giving and support for the applications that are building on Hedera. Well, it's a huge pleasure to have you on the podcast. You've got an extensive experience in high-tech PR. In fact, our paths have crossed in the past, and I worked with you on setting up a, an interview for somebody else there. But So it's great to have you on here today. And you have seen a tremendous shift in how technology shapes our lives along the way. I think it's something we both have. So one of the reasons I invited you on today was to maybe elaborate on the transformation from we the people to we the product, especially as our private information and data are seemingly brought and sold online without us even realizing. I think we're all waking up to it now, but can you expand on that? Yeah, absolutely. And first of all, thank you for having me. So, you know, I think we have, throughout sort of our history of living online, we have started to take for granted that a lot of these products and services are, quote, free, right? A lot of the services that we interact with, a lot of the social networks that we interact with, we don't pay to use them. We don't pay for consumption, but the way that we pay is by giving them our data and by allowing them into all aspects of our lives. They know, you know, so many things about our health. They know about who we are friends with. They know where we live. If you were to, you know, give, if you were to say, please give a stranger access to all that data, you would say, no way. But yet you are giving these huge companies access to that data and they are in turn monetizing it, right? So we have gone from you know, being someone who gets to control everything about ourselves and keep that private to essentially just, you know, different slicing and dicing of, you know, of our preferences and of who we are so that these companies can monetize it. Fantastic. And I know you are incredibly passionate about the world of Web3 and also its potential impact on the future of the internet. And something I try and do on this podcast every day is demystify this space a little and put it in a language that everyone can understand. And I'm sure if we were to ask people listening what Web3 is, how do you define it, we'd probably end up with half a dozen different explanations. So from your point of view here, can you offer the listeners an overview of how you see Web3, what it is, and why it's so important for application builders and developers? Sure. So I see it along sort of two different axes. One is the axes of giving you more control, like we just talked about. And the other is the axes of giving sort of these richer experiences. So if you think about web one, really sort of, you know, read only web, right? You could go to sites, you could sort of, you know, have brochureware, you could read things, you know, was not very interactive. Web 2, you know, you have this emergence of APIs, you have all these integrations. It's, you know, what's typically called the read-write web, right? So you can engage in very different ways, but you still don't have that control of your data. You still have sort of the four horsemen who control big parts of the internet. And then you have big companies saying, yep, and I'm going to, I'm going to scoop up the rest and I'm going to, you know, kind of own that rest of your data. 
Web3 allows you to say, okay, well, let me take a little bit more granular control of what I do on the internet. And therefore, I can have richer experiences, whether that is a creator like an athlete or a star who says, great, I want to have these experiences where I connect most closely with my fan base and I engage with them, you know, my most loyal fans in a very different way than I do sort of some other people, right? You can think about like a, you know, a a Taylor Swift being able to engage directly with certain groups of people because um, on one hand, she knows who they are based on, you know, kind of their loyalty, but they also decide hey, this is how much I'm going to share, right? I want Taylor to know that about me. I maybe don't want her to know everything about me, but I want her to understand that, you know, I've followed her from town to town or something like that. So it is really this, you know, being able to have a much more granular focus on what we do and don't share online and therefore be able to cultivate experiences and offerings that, you know, that both sides are comfortable with. And I spoke with Gary Vaynerchuk on this podcast, I think it was about five years ago. And back then, he used a very similar analogy to yourself and said that if you're a third party, an intermediary or a, a middleman in any line of business, you are in trouble because blockchain is going to take you out of the game. And of course, blockchain has become a significant buzzword, but still, there are many business leaders that struggle to understand its practical implications and, hey, what problem is it solving for me and my huge business here? Or, Fortune 500 company. So can you explain why blockchain and Web3 are crucial for the future of businesses and also how they can benefit companies in tangible ways? Because we've heard about the hype, but I think it's solving those problems and in a language that businesses can understand. That's how we increase adoption. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, businesses have been on sort of this journey of digital transformation, right? And if you ask even most CEOs, you know, but definitely CTOs and sort of line of business owners, they understand what that means. You know, they understand they have brought their products and services online. They have brought their backends online. So they have experienced that sort of digital transformation all the way up until that very last mile, right? But if you think about a lot of companies today, take, for example, a consumer company, they still don't necessarily have that very last piece of interaction with their consumer. So I am a brand. I sell my products at Target. I sort of get a very broad response from Target of these are the products that sold well or these are the things that didn't and, you know, I don't know why. But if you are able to have a direct relationship with that consumer, you can more clearly give them what they want without having to say, I need to know everything about you, right? I need to know all of your information and, you know, everything about you, but you can give them what they want and you can have that data to better improve your products. I think, you know, a really funny one that I talk about in this space, which I think a lot of people don't talk about in this space because our space is I don't know, 85% make, is makeup, right? We were talking the other day about, you know, how great would it be to have sort of that personalization, right? And the makeup that I use is different from someone who has different coloring or might be a different age from me. And, you know, some of the some of the men in the room who had never had to experience that were like, well, why would you need to personalize makeup? And all of the women looked at each other and were like, well, why wouldn't you, right? Why wouldn't you engage with a brand that really has things that are tailored for you and understands you and, you know, can deliver up to you choices that are much more in line with what you want to share with them, right? I may not want to share everything with them, but I may want to share certain pieces with them so that they can have a better set of products for me and that I'm going to be more loyal to that brand. So I think once we start talking in terms that businesses understand digital transformation, that last mile of digital transformation, customer engagement, customer loyalty. Those are the kinds of things where we are very much seeing that be a, you know, a first. And, you know, the other thing is, quite frankly, we have to see some successes. So I think we have actually this year seen that. A great example is Starbucks, right? So, you know, people have been trying to figure out how to make money out of, off of NFTs And no surprise, Starbucks is one of the first that has generated a huge amount of revenue for that. I think they've generated, you know, somewhere north of half a million dollars in revenue for no 
physical cost product, right? They haven't had to sell a single cup of coffee to generate that revenue, but they have you know, created a loyalty experience among some of their most loyal customers who value you know, what Starbucks is providing them and value that connection in the digital world as well. So once you start seeing that, I think we're going to have a lot of people fast following in terms of, oh, wait, it is, you know, it is creating these business opportunities for me. I think the ones we probably won't see as much, but will be happening in the back end are, you know, the sort of back end operations and infrastructure that can be enabled by blockchain. So if I can make my supply chain more transparent and, you know, I can make that clear, if I can make my ESG initiatives more transparent to my shareholders. Those kinds of things are not necessarily things that the everyday consumer is going to see or touch, but they are going to change businesses on the on what I think of more in sort of that back office function. Incredibly cool. Absolutely love that. And I'm going to make you feel slightly uneasy now because before any guest comes on this podcast, I always try and do a little research on them, find out <laughs> a bit more about them. So I can't and any good host does. Yeah, so I Googled you. I'm going to be completely <laughs> honest here. And I discovered some, that you were a cheerleader for the 49ers and also worked for Intel. I feel there's a great story there. But before we go there and find out more about your origin story, I'm curious. You seem perfectly qualified to answer this. How do you see the intersection of technology and sport? Is there a, a specific role that blockchain and Web3 can play in that industry? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, you are starting to see... There's some, you know, sort of other things happening in the environment that are not blockchain related, but will enable these kinds of models. So, you know, the NIL, name, image and likeness ruling that allows not professional, but college athletes to actually capitalize on their name, image and likeness and make money from endorsement deals while they are still in college or while they are not considered, you know, professional. That's a really interesting trend because you are seeing some of these you know, these athletes think about themselves much earlier on as a brand and, you know, as something that they can market and monetize. So we actually, you know, we work with a company called Galaxy there. It's, you know, it's Ormontu for Creators Galaxy. And essentially they are saying, okay, great. If you are an athlete, you might be a huge name athlete who could easily get this stuff done, but you might be, you know, an athlete who has a smaller but very loyal fan base who might be willing to, you know, pay for experiences or collectibles that, you know, that are part of your brand. So you're seeing athletes and others start to say, wait a minute, how can I, you know, potentially have an NFT collection that I, you know, that I offer up to my most loyal fans? How can I, you know, potentially use distributed systems to have one-on-one engagement with these fans, keeping my privacy and their privacy? So there's lots of things going on in that space. I think you're also seeing, you know, a- athletics has always been a place for collectibles. If I think about how much, you know, money we have spent as a family because both of my kids are loyal Lionel Messi fans, right? Wow. Like, I'm like, okay, New Jersey time is probably, you know, pr- will probably be, re- you know, that will probably be on the Christmas list this year. But, you know, if you think about those kinds of collectibles and how people want to demonstrate their fandom, that's another great way where we're seeing people, you know, be able to record that, not just demonstrate it for, hey, the five people who are around me or, you know, the card that I have that's kept in a beautiful book of baseball cards, but I want to be able to showcase that digitally and I want to be able to have other people say, oh, that really is an original or that really is a signed version. And so the, you know, the ability to authenticate some of these collectibles from, athletes and teams, et cetera, I think is really interesting. And a few weeks ago, we had Rusty McFeeve from Galaxy. He was discussing the surge in investment in the creator economy and the implications of real world Web3. And he was also talking about reinventing that creator fan relationship in Web3. It's fantastic. I think it was episode 2395 for anyone listening, but they're doing great work about Galaxy, aren't they? That's a good memory. Yeah, I, I remembered Galaxy as we were talking and I just looked up the episode number. Yeah, so I would definitely get that a lesson. They're doing a lot of exciting stuff. There's, you know, it's beautiful. It's a great way for, I think, fans are going to love to be able to engage with folks that way. And of course, the other big topic, whenever anyone talks about blockchain, is adoption. I think that's the number one challenge for businesses now. So do you have any insights you can share around real world adoption of blockchain and distributed ledger technology? Are there any industries leading the charge? What kind of impact are they seeing? 
Absolutely. So, you know, I don't know how long we have. I think I could go yeah. for a full hour just talking about those use cases. I will yeah. just try to highlight a couple for the sake of time. I think a really interesting one that we're seeing is sort of this convergence of supply chain and ESG. So we have production application on the Hedera network. It's called Atma.io. It is done by Avery Dennison. Now you typically think Avery Dennison, they create, you know, mailing labels, but they actually create labels that live, you know, that are used by many different industries, clothing industries, fast food industries, you know, other kinds of consumer industries. And essentially what they are doing is the Atma.io connected cloud helps to demonstrate kind of the provenance of these goods. You know, it helps to demonstrate the supply chain that was, you know, that was used. It helps to demonstrate how much, you know, carbon was potentially used in the production of items. You know, they are doing billions of transactions on the Hedera network. So that is a very real world application that is, you know, that is live and in production and moving along, you know, very nicely. I think we're seeing others in supply chain start to say, wait a minute, if you know, that's now going to be a competitive advantage for them, right? That's something where, you know, if I'm going to Avery Dennison versus someone else and I can kind of automatically incorporate my ESG efforts and my sort of carbon capture efforts, you know, that that gives them a leg up. We're seeing a lot around CBDCs and payments, you know, and as well as stable coins. I think that is an area where you know, it is global. And I think every central bank is looking at how do they make the cost of finance lower for their constituents, right? It should not cost you $30 to do some certain, you know, different kinds of financial transactions. So, you know, that's another area where we are certainly seeing some, a lot of folks paying attention, starting to deploy things and thinking about, okay, how do I work you know, how do I educate regulators in different geographies, right? Because that is a lot of work as well. We know the technology is there. It's being proven out. Actually, Shinhan Bank, which is one of our governing council members, and SCB Tech out of Singapore and a few others just did a second POC, again, sort of demonstrating this works. Now, you know, let's continue to have those conversations with those regulators. We're also seeing a lot of traction in the tokenization of of traditional assets. So I would call that, you know, both real world, world physical assets that you can see, things like art as well as real estate. You know, to- if you can tokenize home ownership and make that fractional home ownership a lot more affordable, I think that's a really interesting area where we're actually seeing people doing that, right? And they're saying, okay, we've tokenized house, we get to have investors own a part of it, you know, we own a part of it, but that opens up that entry point for people. And the other, you know, area is things like equity, things like funds, you know, tokenization of funds so that you can more easily, you know, buy and sell those funds. If you think about sort of the lead time today on, you know, you go to buy a mutual fund and it's, hey, I'll let you know in three days if this trade has been confirmed and, you know, fingers crossed. And you're like, well, that doesn't seem super efficient. You know, seems like we could streamline that process and we could make that a lot more, you know, efficient, cost effective, less paperwork and other things on the back end. So, you know, I think that you're seeing this really interesting mix of traditional finance and, you know, what has been called DeFi. And it initially started off like, hey, we're going to try our own financial products that are all blockchain based. Now you're really seeing traditional financial services say, wait a minute, I have actual problems in my, you know, existing systems that I think can be fixed by blockchain technology. So I think that's actually pretty exciting because it does not require a consumer who has this mindset of, I'm going to go into digital assets and digital, you know, just decentralized finance. It is opening that aperture up to a much larger base of people who already have traditional assets in many classes. It's such an interesting space at the moment. We could almost dedicate a section of this to an entirely different episode because it feels like for 10 years, the establishment and traditional finance were discrediting and trying to shut down the world of crypto and Web3. Now we've almost come full circle and it's now about regulating and bringing it globally, as you were saying there with the CDBC thing, where do you stand on this as someone that's been in the industry for so long and now seeing CDBCs coming up? 
Do you have a love-hate relationship with this? No, I think, you know, I think it's good. And I think, you know, we as an industry had to do our part to make sure that the technology evolved too, right? If you were trying to do, if you were trying to do things on the Bitcoin network, if you were trying to do things on Ethereum version one, you were essentially saying to a traditional financial services firm, like, you know, by the way, your cost of doing transactions might be a couple dollars, but it might also be a couple hundred dollars. Does that work for you? They're going to say no, right? So we, Hedera has from day one been denominated in USD. So the transactions cost a fraction of a penny and they stay consistent. And I think there is growing recognition that, look, if you're going to deal with traditional businesses, then traditional business metrics apply. One is that you really have to understand your cost of goods sold. If you tell me that my cost of goods sold can be wildly variable depending on the price of a cryptocurrency and I'm a traditional financial services firm, I'm going to say, no, thanks. You know, that doesn't like that's a non-starter. So, you know, some of these things, it's not just the burden is not just on financial services to understand the technology. The burden is on us as a, you know, a blockchain and Web3 community to say, wait a minute, you know, let's not suspend disbelief. Let's not make, you know, make them have to ha force an entirely new paradigm of thinking and, you know, try to challenge very solid business principles in order to use this technology. Let's make sure that we have a business model that also makes sense and that they can relate to you. Love that. And as SVP of communications, Hadira Hashgraph, you are at the forefront of developing some of these next-gen blockchain technologies. And I'm also conscious there'll be a few people listening that have not heard of you guys. So for those people, can you tell me a bit more about Hedera Hashgraph and how it's different from other blockchain solutions out there? Sure. So Hedera was started, the Hashgraph algorithm was invented by Dr. Lehman Baird, who is just, you know, an amazing at his heart, an amazing mathematician, right? This was an amazing math problem that he needed to solve in terms of how do you come to consensus quickly, you know, and securely, and how do you make sure that bad actors can't, you know, can't interrupt that process of coming to consensus? So Dr. Baird and Mance Harmon are the two co-founders of Hedera. They actually started out when he developed the Hashgraph algorithm, it started out with something called Swirls, which was the private permissioned version of the Hashgraph algorithm. In 2018, we launched Hedera, which was the public version of Hedera. And so, you know, I think if we're trying to sum it up very quickly, Hedera is different on a number of fronts. One, as we talked about, the cost of transactions is fixed. So there's no surprises. You know, the costs are a fraction of a penny. So you can actually model out hey, as I grow, if this project or this business is going to be wildly successful, I can very clearly understand what my cost of goods sold is going to be when I'm small, but also when I'm you know, the biggest company in this space. They both also come from a cybersecurity background. So that was also very important to us. Hedera, the algorithm is ABFT, asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant. The essentially you can trust what is on the ledger, right? You can have that sort of enterprise required level of trust in terms of the transactions that have happened, the validity of those transactions, the order of those transactions, all those kinds of things. And then the other thing that, you know, we realized was that this infrastructure has to be green and, you know, it has to be it cannot be hugely energy consumptive. We, you know, we're talking today about, you know, sort of the world is boiling, right? We're in the middle of summer 2023 and it's been the hottest year on record. You hear all the conversations about how much Bitcoin mining and, you know, consumes energy. Hedera from day one has been extremely energy efficient. You can look, there are studies from folks like University College London that showcase the energy consumption of various different blockchains. And Hedera is always at the bottom, which is where we want to be, right? Which is the lowest consumption per transaction. That is really important as we think about, we talked previously, you know, any application that is thinking about 
you know, ESG and is thinking about their environmental impact, it's very hard to justify, well, I'm going to go then put that application on a blockchain that's very energy intensive. That's just, you know, those two things. Again, the business side of you says, no, that doesn't make sense. So, you know, it is fast, it is fair, it is secure, and it is low energy consumption. The other thing that makes Hedera a little bit different is the governing council. So Hedera is a public network. Anybody, it's open source. Anybody can go start building on the network, run your applications. We don't even know, you know, a lot of times when people are building on the network because they just build. Anyone can access it. The governing council, though, does serve as, you know, the way to govern the code base, to think about important decisions that are made you know, in terms of the the overall direction of the platform. And the reason why we thought that was important was because I think if, you know, if you saw early on, for example, at one point, the huge majority of the Bitcoin miners were based in China, right? That's not the case today, but you want to plan for governance to be distributed. You want to plan for governance to be distributed across industries, across you know, different companies across geographies and across time. Because if you don't build that governance in from day one, you have sort of this entropy back to chaos. So the governing council, which includes some of the world's largest companies, but also big research institutions and educational institutions, really serves as that, you know, that mechanism to vote on big council decisions, to vote on the direction of the network to vote on treasury management decisions. The governing council, you know, I think there are now, they each run a node. I think there are now nodes on six continents. So if you think about how distributed that infrastructure is, it's more distributed than most blockchains, but they really serve that role to run the initial nodes on the network until the time where we feel like there's enough security that anybody can run a node. And then they also serve to help make those decisions and bring those different perspectives to bear, you know, having been very successful companies and research institutions themselves. And a few months ago, for anyone that missed it, we spoke to Lehman Baird, co-founder of Hedera and inventor of Ashgra. Such good feedback on that episode. And he blew me away. To say is a genius is somewhat of an understatement, isn't he? Such a visionary. <laughs> he is. You know, he is. He's so smart and he's so humble. And I yeah. think, you know, sometimes for me as a PR person, I'm like, Lehman, I want you to scream from the rooftops. You know, I want you to tell everyone all of this. And, you know, but he is really, he's really humble. But the way that he thinks about things for the long term, I think a lot of those things, you know, he has proven himself to be right. And we're only five years into this journey. So, you know, if he has this vision for a hundred year company, you can, you know, you, the data so far demonstrates that his vision and his, you know, things that he's thinking about in terms of planning for that length have been spot on. 100%. And I've just quickly looked that up. It's episode 2257 for anyone that would like to go back and have a listen to that. And in more serious matters, though, of course, given the recent high profile cybersecurity breaches that we're seeing on an almost daily basis now, I'm going to ask you, are there any tips tools or recommendations that you would offer to enterprise architects that can enhance their blockchain security practices because security has never been more important, has it? Yeah. And I think, you know, an interesting area where this is also coming together is with generative AI, right? And I think there's a concern, hey, generative AI is going to be an issue for cybersecurity because it's going to be much easier to you know, to create scams, right? To create fake versions of people, to create fake voices, to create emails that look much more authentic. So I think blockchain is already today, but also will play a bigger role in terms of verifying the source of these kinds of content. So, you know, maybe I am only, you know, I'm only going to trust things that come from certain verified sources, or there is a way for me to authenticate the source of, you know, content, other creations, all the types of things that are inundating people today. Because, you know, still today, even though we have very complex cybersecurity solutions and we have very sophisticated hackers, the most common way that organizations get breached is 
starting with a phishing attempt, right? So starting with something where, you know, somebody clicks on something, somebody, you know, downloads something, and all of a sudden you have, you know, then you have all these these solutions that are trying to fix the back end of that, right? Trying to sort of segment, trying to block. But if we can, at the source, identify much more quickly, this is authentic versus this is not authentic, that is going to help us before it ever gets to a human who may not be able to judge that as as well as something that has a huge amount of data. And I'm conscious we've been talking a lot about introducing business leaders to Hedera and try and encourage adoption and new customers and new clients, new members of your community. But we're also going to have a lot of loyal members of the Hedera community listening today who might be waiting for a few teasers at the end of this episode. So for those people listening, what's next? What can we expect to see from Hedera Hashgraph Hashgraph in the near future? Are there any upcoming initiatives or breakthroughs you're excited to share with us? You're probably locked down to embargoes and NDAs, but (laughs) is there anything you can leave us with? Well, I wouldn't be a good head of comms and I wouldn't be able to, you know, with a straight face, tell everyone else who speaks on behalf of Hedera to, you know, don't do that. If I shared anything that I couldn't, you know, that was not public or able to be shared. But I think on the development side, you are seeing a lot in terms of, you know, not only EVM compatibility, but EVM equivalents. We're working very hard. We recognize there's a huge Ethereum community. And I think, you know, our efforts there are very tied into what's happening in the broader ecosystem. So in the broader market, you're getting this recognition that different chains will have to work together, different people will prefer different chains for various things within their organization. That's the way every generation of computing has gone, right? You've never had one leader and everybody else sort of goes home. You've had companies say, this is, you know, sort of fit for purpose for what I want to do here. So you will see a lot more things that we are doing to get to that EVM equivalents, and also to just bring the entire, you know, ecosystems together, right? It, as long as we can um, think about what are ways that it's easier for different pieces of the ecosystem together, and we can support projects that are building those various different pieces of the puzzle, you know, that is the continued march, right? So it is not sexy. It is not breaking news, but it is the kind of work that needs to be done in order for much, much broader adoption to happen. And I think that's a beautiful moment to end on. But before I do, thank you for sharing your insights today. And I want to ask you to leave one final gift for everyone listening. And that is a book that you would recommend that we can add to our Amazon wish list. So if I was to ask you to leave a book for everyone listening today, what would that book be and why? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I, I'm sure my friends are sick of me hearing me talk about it, but I read a great book called The End of the World is Just the Beginning. It is not a light summer read, but it's interesting because it talks about a lot of, you know, sort of trends in the world, right? Population, you know, natural resources. It helps you realize, okay, we are, you know, we are in the day to day of sort of building these technologies, but there are big problems in the world and how do we use those technologies for good? How do we think about ourselves within the much, much broader world and, you know, what is happening and how do we be sort of conscious agents for good change? Well, and for anyone listening, well, I'll get that added straight to our Amazon wish list. And for anyone listening, would like to join your community, contact your team, just keep up to speed with the developments that we've talked about today. What's the best starting point for everything? Yeah, probably still Twitter at Hedera. You can find some of the community there. And then, of course, you know, we have Discord and other channels. But you can, if you are a builder and you want to build, you can just go to Hedera.com and you can learn how to set up a testnet account and start playing around with the network. If you are already in development and, you know, you're looking for funding and other support for your ideas, we have the HBAR Foundation, the Hashgraph Association, and the DLT Science Foundation, which all provide different pieces of support for the Hedera ecosystem. Well, we covered so much in a short amount of time today for Web3 and its potential impact on the future of the internet and how blockchain tech has become a significant buzzword, but business leaders have struggled to understand the practical implications, but why it's so crucial for the future of every business and every industry and how they can benefit in tangible ways from it. I even had time to leave us with a great book today, but we didn't get time to find out more about you. 
your life as a cheerleader for the 49ers and your work at Intel. So we will get you back on maybe later in the year to find out more about your story. But more than anything, just thank you for joining me today. I would love that. Thank you so much for having me. So a huge thank you to Zenobia for shedding light on some of the most crucial aspects of the modern internet, blockchain and Web3, getting beyond the buzzwords and discussing how our privacy has morphed into a product, but the potential of Web3 in reshaping the future of the internet. And one of the things I particularly loved there was discussing that game-changing advantage of Hedera Hashgraph. And anyone that wants to dive a little bit deeper, I urge you to check out episode 2257 with Lehman Baird, the the co-founder of Hedera and inventor of Hashgraph. It really is a great listen, that one. One of the big things I'll be taking away from today's conversation, though, is the internet that we deserve is the one that we must strive for. And I think with leaders like Zenobia working at the forefront of technological innovation, I think we can hope for a future where the digital world can be safer, more equitable, and offer a more equitable space for everybody involved. But I'd love to invite you to join this conversation. Send me an email, techblogwriteroutlook.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, just at Neil C. Hughes. Let me know your thoughts. If you've got any questions you want to ask, send them my way. If you want to send an audio question that I can answer and add to a future episode. And equally, I'm happy to put the microphone in front of you and sit down and have a conversation with you too. Whatever is easiest for each and every one of you. But that's it for today. It's time for me to sign off. So stay curious, stay inspired, keep learning. Thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. (laughs) 